<laughs> okay. Back to 2 Samuel. We're going to be focusing on chapter 9, but let's quickly summarize chapters 7 and 8. You know, you know last week we were in chapter 7, and uh, <clears throat> David wanted to build God a house, right, because he's living in a mansion. <laughs> he's that we need to build God a house, you know, instead of having the ark out there in a tent, right? And God said, no, not you. <laughs> but I'm going to do some good things for you, right? Your dynasty, your lineage is going to last forever. <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> and David praised God. But, and then we have this summary of the wars. He defeats the Philistines. He defeats Moab. He defeats Zobah and Aram, you know, the, the Assyrians, right? And he gets spoils from all these places. So all their gold and silver and all that, and he has it all sent to Jerusalem. Okay? And he dedicated it to the Lord. In chapter 8, verse 11, King David also dedicated these to the Lord with the silver and gold that he had dedicated from all the nations which he had subdued. Right? <clears throat> and it says in 13, David made a name for himself when he returned from killing 18,000 Armenians in the Valley of Salt. <laughs> okay. Then he put garrisons like in Edom. But in verse uh, 14, and the Lord helped David wherever he went. You think, you think God's helping you everywhere, wherever you go? He's got to be. <laughs> <laughs> Probably so, right? And then in chapter 9, David said, Is there yet anyone left in the house of Saul? Saul was the former king, right? And in those days... If you had a new king, what would he normally do to the relatives of the old king? Kill them. Have them all killed. So nobody could come up and say, you know, I should be king, right? I was going to say pardon, but apparently that was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, they would kill him, you know. And he says, anybody left in the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Remember, David and Jonathan had made an oath together. Jonathan expected David to become king, and he would be David's second in command, kind of like he was Saul's second in command, right? Even though he was in line to be king, he had no problem with David being the king, which is really kind of amazing you know, when you think about human beings <laughs> and how we normally react, you know, Saul's having a big hissy fit because David was anointed the next king, <laughs> trying to kill him, chasing him around for years. <laughs> and David's helping him escape. Or not David, Jonathan is helping David escape, right? This uh, phrase, show him kindness. This is not a lighthearted deal. This is a serious kind of, I really want to help these, these, anybody that would fit, you know, any of Saul's descendants that are still alive for Jonathan's sake. You know, David and Jonathan had a special relationship. Now, there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. Now, <laughs> Ziba was taking care of all of Saul's lands. He and his household, right? He gets called into the new king. <laughs> he was probably a little bit nervous too. It's one thing to hear that David's wanting to show kindness. It's another thing to actually expect to see kindness, you know. Especially when you've been a part of the camp of what 
anybody would call David's enemy, right? And the king said, Is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? I like that phrase. You know, in nowadays, you know, post-resurrection, <laughs> we would call it grace. Aren't you happy God shows us grace? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Man, if I got what I deserved, whew, God would have had to zap me a long time ago. <laughs> Just get him out of here. <laughs> right? This is amazing, the kindness of God. And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. So not only is he a descendant of Saul, he's actually Jonathan's son. This probably thrilled David. He had a son of Jonathan to show, right, and to honor to show the kindness and to honor and to, you know, treat him special because he was Jonathan's. Now, he's not only the grandson of Saul, he's Jonathan's son. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, behold, he is in the house of Meshir, the son of Anmiel, in Lodabar. Lodabar is on the other side of the Jordan over here. So he's almost in hiding. Staying away from David is, you know, probably, you know, we get the story about the the lady that was carrying him out and dropped him, and that's how he got his feet broken, and they didn't have any good surgeons in those days to put his feet back together, and so he, he ends up crippled, right? And he was probably about five years old, and they drag him off, Right away, now of course they're thinking someday he's going to become king because <laughs> he's Saul's grandson, you know, and he's the the lone surviving member of Saul's household, right? So they they take him off over here. Uh, by the way, do we know anything about Mashir? Anybody remember his name from anywhere? He actually is one of the guys later when Absalom is rebelling and David now is on the run for a little while, it's Meshir that helps him. Okay? In verse 4, the end of verse 4, and then again in verse 5, the king David on verse 5 sent and brought him from the house of Meshir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar, so he brings him back to Jerusalem. And the son's name, Mephibosheth, <laughs> right? The son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he said, Here is your servant. Now, he was probably really nervous as to what's about to happen. <laughs> Because, you know, again, tradition is those guys are all wiped out. And he was just a little boy when Saul and Jonathan were killed. So he knew very little about the special relationship between David and Jonathan, if anything at all. all right? <clears throat> but David said to him, do not fear. How many times in the Bible do we read about an angel appears and the person does what? Face down. Yeah. And what does the angel say? Do not fear. Yeah, don't be afraid. Similar kind of deal, right? He shows up and David says, don't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Because... I will surely show you kindness for you 
kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and will restore you all the lands of your grandfather, Saul, and you shall eat at my table regularly. So Mephibosheth drops down and shows honor to David, right? David then tells him, don't be afraid, and then, quote-unquote, restores the lands. Think about that for a minute. The lands, remember Saul was a Bethlehemite, not Bethlehem, a Benjamite, right? So that, that's down here by Jerusalem. That's the, the, the land of, of Benjamin was down by Jerusalem, Okay? So Saul's lands are down here. He's way up over here, kind of like in hiding. So this Ziba guy is running the lands as if it's his own. And David says, you get all your grandfather's lands. Good for Mephibosheth. But what about Ziba? <laughs> right? We know from later on that Ziba lies to David and tries to trick David into saying that Mephibosheth had sided with Absalom and thus he should get all of Saul's lands. So we know he wasn't that much of a straight up dude, okay, from later on. He did, probably didn't like that. The orders to the till all that land and everything. But now, yeah, because now he's going to get wages, but he's not going to get the profits, right. right? He has to give the profits to Mephibosheth, right? So, well, what can he do? Standing before the king, <laughs> right? He doesn't have anything to argue with. And it, but then David tells Mephibosheth, and you shall eat at my table regularly. Who eats at the table? <laughs> what are his kids? Yeah. This is like saying you are now my adopted son. Again, he prostrated himself and said, What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? And you remember, in those days, dogs were like scavengers. So a dog is a bad thing. A dead dog is even worse. <laughs> you know, remember, they weren't even supposed to touch a human corpse that died, let alone a dead dog, right? He said, what is, you know, what, I'm just a dead dog. Why would you do this for me? And the king called Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, all that belonged to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. Okay, so we know he's going to betray him later, but remember Mephibosheth is out kind of like running from David, hiding out there in Lobihar, right? And yet David gives him all the lands of his grandfather and says, come stay in my house. Eat at my table. This is kind of like God's grace, right? I mean, did he deserve any of that? <laughs> Not really. You know, do we deserve any of God's grace? <laughs> no. <laughs> In verse 10 he says, And you and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him, and you shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. 
How many people had 20 servants? Rich people, right? So he had made himself rich working Saul's lands. And he had 15 sons, which implies multiple wives. Once again, the wealthy people would have multiple wives, even though it was a violation of God's law on marriage, right? You know, I don't know how you handle that. <laughs> I have enough trouble keeping one woman happy. <laughs> if you had two or more guys. <laughs> All they were was sex toys. Concubines and whatnot, but yeah. You know, because remember, women were just property too back in those days. Solomon had the right idea. I guess. <laughs> yeah. 300 wives and 700 concubines. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but nonetheless, so we know that he had a lot. Now you notice David had told him that you and your sons and your servants. David knew what Ziba had and how he got it, right? He said, but now you're going to do this for your master's grandson. <laughs> okay. And Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so that your servant will do. Again, standing there in the king's presence, did he have any other choice? He said, we know from future, <laughs> he didn't care for this. <laughs> right? So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. By the way, his real name uh, was like, I forgot now, it's like Mephibobiel, you know, but Baal becomes the futility god that becomes a real problem for Israel in the future. So when this is all written down, you know, just like who was the other guy they changed his name because he didn't want to have the Baal at the end, right? So they put the uh, for self at the end, which means shame for some, you know, I mean... <laughs> Right? Instead of Baal. So his name gets changed to this. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. So all him, him, his wives, his sons, his servants. <laughs> right? Is there a, a story about Micah or Mika, whatever that yeah, is? Yeah, Micah. Is that going to come up later? Or is that just a simple mention? There is a mention of him in the ancestry later. Okay. That's all that I recall seeing. You just talk about his sons and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate at the king's table regularly. Then he goes back and says, now he was lame in both feet. It's interesting to come back and tell us that, <laughs> right? So think about this. How did he get from low Debar all the way to Jerusalem? Since he can't walk Well, he was over, uh, on a donkey or something. Or a yeah, probably a donkey or a cart. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He was carried. Now, how did he enter Jerusalem and enter into the king's presence? I can't answer that. Maybe somebody carried him. Somebody probably carried him. Right. He was carried in. How old was he? Well, we can surmise that it's been about 20 years from the time that David had <clears throat> become king, right? And Saul died and all of that till today, right? Because he's gone through all these different wars and whatnot, you know, and all that. And uh, so if he was five at the time, he's probably in his middle 20s or something like that. He's already got a son, right? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
So somebody carries him into the king's presence. How do we enter the king's presence? By believing in Jesus. And how do we do that? You ask too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> I got one answer. <laughs> you can't walk on your knees. I mean, you can, but that's. Uh. What causes you to believe in Jesus? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So we are actually carried into the King's presence by the Holy Spirit. Ooh, nice example. He didn't have anything to offer the King. We don't have anything to offer the King. Right? We don't get saved because we are pursuing God, right? We get saved because God pursues us. Was Mephibosheth looking for David? No. No, he was kind of running from David, just like we're usually running from God when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of us. And just as David went and got him, the Holy Spirit goes out and gets us and carries us into the king's presence to make us what? What do we become? Joint heirs with Jesus as adopted sons, right? Mm. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Think about that for a second. Just like Mephibosheth, right, is now an adopted son to the king. We are the same, but in God's house. Joint heirs with Jesus. Can you imagine? <laughs> I can't either. I can't even figure out what that means. But it sure does sound good, right? We know some things it means. Eternal life with Jesus, right? Now, on a little bit lower level, David had been fighting his wars, right? So he'd been busy. Now he's got everything subdued, literally from down all the way down here, right? All the way up to Damascus. Damascus is in control of David. The Syrians and the Assyrians, etc., they've all everybody's been subdued. They were called Armenians at this time, right? They're all subdued. And he's got garrisons in these places. In case anybody wants to get out of line, he can slap them back down, right? And he's sucking all the gold and silver, <laughs> bringing it to Jerusalem and dedicating it to God. Right? So in this area, so in the time of David and the time of Solomon was the biggest, most powerful position Israel had in history. You remember the land promised to Abraham went all the way from the river all the way to the great river Euphrates. This is all belongs to Israel. They can argue about the Gaza Strip all they want, <laughs> right? Or anything else for that matter. But the so-called Transjordan area, that's part of Israel, right? You know, all that up there, Lebanon and, and uh, Syria, that's all, that all belongs to Israel. God gave it to them. But the Arabs don't want them to have even that tiny <laughs> sliver yeah. of land they occupying now. Yeah. So here we have David finishing up these wars, right? We get this synopsis of these wars. Now in Chronicles, we get more detail on the different wars in First Chronicles. But in here, we just get like the synopsis of the wars. The wars are ending, right? He's got everything under control. <laughs> Anything he could want, you know, he's 
as Solomon becomes the richest man at this point, David's the richest guy in, in probably in the world, <laughs> right? And and what does he do? He remembers Jonathan. What can I do for Jonathan? Right? And he extends his hand to jo- to Jonathan's descendant, to his son, right? And was Mephibosheth's life changed? Sure. <laughs> Dramatically, right? Yeah. And of course, God does that for us. How often do we have the opportunity to do something nice for somebody else? Which may make a significant difference in their life. Probably now, more than you think. Yeah. Now, to David... Those lands of Saul, whatever it took to feed himself at the palace, it's minuscule, right? It's the idea of him becoming part of David's family, right? So it's not like it's something that we do is a tremendous sacrifice on our part, but something that comes up and and the Holy Spirit just kind of tweaks you saying, you should do this. You know, maybe it's send ten dollars to this charity. Maybe it's you know, uh, just say a kind word to somebody. You know that uh, during the, if you, if you get the feeling inside you should do something. Well, that's probably the Holy Spirit guiding you that to do it. You know, Satan is not often going to give you thoughts to do something nice, <laughs> right? And so David takes this opportunity and not only does he do something nice but sets the example once again for how God acts, the way he comes after us, does everything for us, saves us, redeems us, right? Brings us into his family, adopts us, makes us join heirs with Christ Jesus. It's mind-boggling. It is. It's hard to understand that. <laughs> yeah. And that's because we're dealing with an infinite God, Jerry, and we don't have infinite brains. <laughs> but maybe we'll understand a lot more when we get to heaven, right? But we're still not going to understand it all, are we? But, but it's going to be too late to do anything for anybody else once we get there. Well, Maybe. Right? One of the things you can't do in heaven is sin. The other thing is you can't witness because everybody's there. (laughs) Right? But can we do something for others? We don't know what God's assignment for us is going to be. We're not going to be just sitting around twiddling our thumbs or playing horns. He's going to have stuff for us to do. And we'll get to do it. Right? Right? Point being, though, is that today, right, as the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. How often can we witness to somebody today? Well, that's Second Samuel chapter 9. Any questions or comments? All right. Well, Heavenly Father.